Hello everyone, welcome to Asura Psych, and this week in my psychopathology course we discussed trauma, how it's clinically defined, and things of that nature. So I thought it might be interesting this week in my video to discuss how trauma relates to personality, but I wanted to discuss this not only through the lens of MBTI, but also maybe like Big Five as well, because I think that there's some serious implications when we talk about experiencing a traumatic event and how it can affect personality overall, and how that might influence our different personality aspects. Now, since we're going to be discussing trauma today, I would like to remind everyone that trauma in and of itself is traumatic sometimes. In discussing these things, we can get into some darker topics. So if you find yourself averse to these kinds of things or you have experienced some serious traumas in your life and you don't want to be reminded of these things, it might be best to skip this particular video. That said, let's get into it. So before we can continue forward, we kind of need to talk about the two different types of traumas that we'll be discussing today. So when you're looking at the DSM and how they classify trauma, there's a specific trauma that is kind of talked about when you're talking about PTSD and a trauma that's categorized as being harsh enough almost to cause PTSD. And the difference here between that and say maybe a normal life trauma or stressor is that a trauma that's going to be enough to cause a diagnosis for PTSD is usually something that's life-threatening to either you, yourself, someone you care about, a family member, things of that nature. You have to genuinely feel as if you are going to be in harm's way and it's enough to cause some sort of serious psychological switch. Because this type of trauma, this specific type of trauma, activates the body's kind of fight or flight response and causes some more serious mental issues in the head. Now this can be different to say a normal life trauma. Say you have a family member who is constantly yelling at you or something of that nature. It might be a lot of psychological stress, but it's not life-threatening. And this is what separates it from a trauma that's going to be, see, say, PTSD-inducing. And it's important to have these two categories because in clinical diagnosis, this is how they treat them. There's the traumas and stressors that are going to be essentially non-severe and that, of course, they're still severe. They still cause issues, but they're not life-threatening and therefore they're not going to cause the the physiological response that these other types of traumas are likely to cause and therefore are going to cause the more so severe PTSD related symptoms. Trauma is not always an easy thing to talk about when you're going to talk about how it impacts somebody because something that would be traumatic to a single person could be almost a non-event to another person. And trauma is usually relative to the kind of life experiences that the person who is experiencing the trauma uh, has. So say for example, you have a woman on the street and she gets mugged by someone at knife point. This could be a very traumatic experience for this woman because she genuinely feels like her life is in danger. Uh, she has no way to defend herself, something along that lines. It's going to be kind of a harsh situation for her that's going to cause a more serious psychophysiological response to the situation. Now say you had this same um, individual who was doing the mugging come up on someone who was a veteran and had combat experience for 15 years. The odds of this individual, the combat veteran, experiencing some sort of trauma related to this life-threatening event is not going to be as high as the person who doesn't have that experience with something like this. So this is why trauma is kind of relative to the experience that someone has. And something that is traumatic to one individual may not be traumatic to another. And it's really hard to kind of quantify this because this applies for all of the psychological areas related to trauma, and you'll find that different people of different personalities, and even personality types, if you look at it like through MPTI, are going to experience different types of traumatic events in different types of way. And if you look at things like children's psychology or developmental psychology, there's also a trait known as like resilience, and resilience might also play into how much someone is going to be able to resist an event that might be likely to cause some sort of psychological distress that would lead to some sort of trauma disorder. So it's very hard to quantify what counts as a traumatic event because we have to be aware of everyone's perception towards this event, how they subjectively feel about it, what led them to their uh, thoughts there. Another thing that's interesting and important to remember when you're talking about a trauma that meets the clinical diagnosis of a trauma, which essentially means life-threatening or could be related to like sexual violence, things of that nature, is that the reason it's classified this specific way is because when people experience trauma in this way, there is that huge psychophysiological response. And one of the main things that happens in the body and mind is the overproduction of cortisol and what this does in the body when this fight or flight response kind of happens and this trauma response begins to happen is that the body 
and mind begin to stop producing memories. And the simplest way I can say that is that the body is trying to survive and it's taking away some of the resources from the other part of the brain to kind of deal with this traumatic issue that it needs to deal with. It's trying to survive. So it pulls away from things like memory. And this is why you often find it's very hard for people who have experienced a trauma to remember the things about the trauma and how it exactly happened because their mind is literally shutting off their memory circuits to attempt to deal with this situation. So it's important to remember these things as we, as we look at trauma and how it affects personality specifically in relation to these kind of heavier traumas. Now, this is something that you're not going to see as much when you talk about the more less severe traumas, the things that don't meet a clinical diagnosis for trauma, as these are more so just extreme life stressors. Someone might experience this subjectively as a trauma, but it's not classified as such if it doesn't mean, meet that clinical diagnosis because it's not activating those psychophysiological responses. It's not causing the body to switch how it entirely functions in that immediate moment into a more survival state kind of mode. So how does trauma impact personality? Well, that's a really big question, and we need to go back to the psychophysiological response if we want to understand how this works. So when you experience a trauma, again, you go through a fight or flight response usually. Cortisol production begins to uh, excel and get higher, and then you're going to see that most of your brain functioning is going to be focused towards survival. So what is essentially happening here when your body goes into this fight or flight response is that your lower order brain functionings related to like your amygdala and even lower than that are going to be producing most of the cognitive functioning and you're going to be entirely focused on getting out of that situation safely or surviving. And what happens when you enter this state is that the brain prioritizes these survival functions, these lower order functionings over higher order functionings associated with like the prefrontal cortex and cognition and consciousness. So essentially when you are experiencing some sort of trauma, your personality is almost temporarily shutting down in certain cases. It's like saying the brain needs to redirect the resources from the personality, from who we are, uh, our conscious thought away from these things and into base animalistic survival. And this is really difficult because you'll see that when someone develops something like post-traumatic stress disorder, they're usually going to be stuck in some sort of semi-permanent state where they're in this psychophysiological response and they're not going to be able to pull as much away from their natural personality traits because the brain is diverting resources to survival. So people who experience PTSD, for example, often have a trait known as hypervigilance. And this is when they might be hyper anxious and aware of their environment. They may look towards the doors to make sure that they have an escape route for where they are. They're going to be focused on their safety. And this is because that lower order brain functioning is focused on survival. And what's happening essentially here is the brain is again, diverting those resource resources away from things like personality and consciousness and cognition and trying to have a more animalistic approach where it's focused on survival. And this is why it's really hard to talk about personality related to trauma because personality begins to kind of wash away as humans experience trauma and they are focused more so on survival because those survival instincts are what is really important to the brain after experiencing something really traumatic when someone is in that post-traumatic state. So the primary personality trait that I could find that was associated with PTSD in terms of clinical research was big five neuroticism, which makes sense because big five is the number one personality assessment in terms of quantitative measurement. But what I found was actually quite interesting. It almost went against what I originally thought. So when I started researching for this video, I thought to myself, well, someone who experiences a trauma most likely is going to have increased levels of neuroticism after the trauma. Maybe their, their neuroticism levels increased. And this is kind of slightly true, but what the research actually showed was that people who already had high neuroticism scores were far more susceptible to experiencing some sort of trauma in a way that would be seriously traumatic to them. So essentially they have a higher susceptibility to experiencing a traumatic event in some way that's going to be perceived as life-threatening or really dangerous to them. And then the symptoms of PTSD are going to be heightened within them. So they're going to experience more negative emotions in response to a traumatic event, as well as be more likely to experience a traumatic event as more serious than it may have initially been. Now this is, so I don't wanna downplay any form of trauma because of course how you experience it is what is really happening to you. 
and that's really important to remember when you're working with someone who has PTSD, you're talking to someone who has PTSD, is that they usually genuinely believe that their life was in danger. But people who are higher in neuroticism are more likely to experience some sort of traumatic event as something life-threatening. And then those symptoms that appear from PTSD and uh, those symptoms related to even other traumatic disorders are going to be heightened. The emotional responses that they have in response to the trauma are going to be heightened. Big five, extroversion and conscientiousness are the two traits that are negatively correlated with having a long-term response to some sort of traumatic event. So essentially, people who are high in extroversion and high in conscientiousness are less likely to develop PTSD following some sort of traumatic event. Now, the reasons for this are because people who are high in extroversion usually feel like they have a, a bigger social network and they have more people that they can reach out to in response to some sort of traumatic event, and they feel like their support network in general is more accommodating to them. Now, that's going to be healthy because if you have people to reach out to and you can talk to, you're going to feel like you have more support in these situations and you're going to be able to more easily vent your issues and seek help when you need it. Now, people who are conscientious are going to usually feel like they have more control over their lives and therefore following some sort of traumatic event, they're usually going to feel like they can make some sort of step in their life to prevent this traumatic event from happening again or prepare it, prepare for it in general. And this is important because if you feel like you have control over the situation, you're less likely to experience some sort of long-term lasting effect from this trauma. Now, of course, this is not universal. People who are high in extroversion and conscientiousness can develop PTSD, but these two specific personality traits are going to be the ones that usually lead to someone dealing with trauma in a way that is a bit better than someone who might be highly introverted or feel like they have uh, low control over their own life. The last thing I'm going to talk about is how MBTI type might be affected by trauma. And there, to my knowledge, is no formal research on how cognitive functions are impacted by trauma. So I'm going to have to stay within the realm of the MBTI traits that are being measured if I want to talk about this and not go into a more subjective kind of viewpoint on it. So the only things that I could find related to this are that introversion and the feeling function are going to be more highly correlated with neuroticism and therefore more likely to experience negative emotional reactivity to some sort of traumatic event. So essentially the IF types are going to be slightly more likely to have some sort of long lasting response to a traumatic event. Now you also might theorize that because the J types are uh, usually higher in conscientiousness in terms of big five, that they might be less susceptible to trauma as well compared to the P types who usually score lower on big five conscientiousness. But that's just a guess and I wouldn't be able to solidify that in any meaningful way. So in reality, there's not a ton of research relating MBTI to trauma, but I do think that there is potential for research within this field in the future. And I think it would be interesting to see how different personality types might respond to different stressors. Something that is stressful to an ISTJ might not be stressful to an ENFP and therefore it might not cause some sort of traumatic response. And you might be able to find differences in what is considered traumatic between the types. All right, everybody, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion on trauma and personality. And I want you to remember that that's what this is. This is more so a discussion video and it's less about me kind of teaching you about these things and more so me opening a discussion about what could be the causes. As of course, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, but I'm not a clinical expert. So treat everything I said in this video with a grain of salt and do your own research if you need to. And remember that, you know, your experiences are valid and it's important to remember that. But that said, I think this is a really interesting topic. And I think that trauma is something that is really difficult to kind of navigate when you're talking about personality psychology because it stems from such a clinical place. And it's, it's almost, again, from those lower order brain uh, functions that exist above the personality aspects in the brain's hierarchy of needs. So that's interesting to me. Other than that, I would like to remind everybody that I do have personality typing sessions available at my website, asurasec.com. If you're interested in working with me to find out what your personality type is and what that means for you. This has been Asura from Asura Psych. Have a good one.